doing a study that we're calling How to Live a Happy Life. How to Live a Happy Life. And we're looking at the book of Ecclesiastes. King Solomon is pursuing after this question, what makes life worth living? What gives a profit to life? This particular lesson is called, What Time Is It? What time is it? And we're going to look at Solomon's searching through time, trying to find a meaning for life. And so the answer, what profit is there in life? What is it that makes life worth living? That, that's what he keeps pursuing. If time is to have any meaning, then it must have purpose. This is one of the things that um, I have been very disappointed with natural science and studying after science and the evolutionist and uh, oh they have all kinds of scientific theories but you follow them read their statements and follow them to the end of their their conclusions and they will always say well we're just dancing to our own dna and you know we, we have no control over it and ultimately life has no meaning no purpose well, I don't know how that leaves you, but that leaves me very empty inside, very empty. I do not believe that. I do not believe that we have been created for that. Solomon didn't believe that either. And so it's the thing that continued to press him, to push him, to try to find the answer. He discovers if we leave God out of our lives, we have also left eternity out of our lives. And all we have left is time. Time. And so in this particular lesson, in chapter 3, that is what he, he looks at. How time relates to us and the fulfillment of purpose. Let, let me divide this into three main sections. Let's talk first of all about the time of life. The time of life. See, time is the stuff that life is made out of. That, 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 that's how we measure it, by seconds and minutes and hours and days and weeks and months and years. We, that we make a chronological study of time. Time. It's what life is made out of. The truth is, every one of us receive the same amount of time each day. Now, it's true, not everybody gets the same amount of years, but today we're all sharing exactly the same time. We all get 24 hours. Nobody got 25 or nobody got 30 or nobody was shortchanged with 18. No, we all got 24 hours. It's what we do with it that makes the difference in our life. And that's what Solomon discovers here. It, it, see, time, time's like a coin. We must spend it, but we can only spend it once. We only have the power, the choice to spend it one time. What we do with it, that is our choice, but that is going to de help to determine what kind of profit that we make with it. So there, there's these daily activities, and he goes into a long list here. It's in your syllabus, in your notes. There's 28 things that he talks about that we are exchanging our time for. We're exchanging our life with all these activities and we managed to stay busy, but did we make a profit? Let, let, let me show you what he's saying. There's a time to be born and there is a time to die. Of course, some people shorten their time and uh, you can do that. There's a time to kill and a time to heal. Now, this is a wise man talking. I know there are people today that say, there's nothing worth dying for. My response is, then there's nothing worth living for. There has to be some things that's worth fighting over. A time to weep and a time to laugh. There's a time to scatter there's a time to gather. See, if you're going to be successful in life, you've got to know what time it is. What time is it? A time to scatter and a time to gather. A time to gain and a time to lose. You're not going to win them all. 
No, you ne no nobody does that. Nobody bats a thousand. We all strike out from time to time. There's a time to tear. There's a time to mend. There's a time to love and a time to hate. Now what he's talking about is ordinary daily occurrences, things that go on in our lives continually that we are investing our time in these things. There is a time to plant. There is a time to harvest. There is a time to destroy and a time to build. There's a time to mourn and a time to dance. Oh, that, that's, that's one of the scriptures I've, I've used a lot of times in churches because some churches get so religious, all they want to do is cry. And I say, what, what about the dancing part? Do you, you know, where, where does that come in? And uh, I believe that there's a time to rejoice in the Lord. There's a time to embrace there's a time to refrain from embracing or to ignore one another. A time to keep, a time to discard, a time for silence, and a time to speak. A time for war, and a time for peace. Now, these are ordinary daily occurrences that happen in our lives continually. We are all engaged and involved in these things. The tragedy is that many people don't know what time it is and they're involved in the wrong thing at the wrong time. So each of us, each of these things cost us a part of our life. We exchange some of our time for these activities. It's the way that we live. And we manage to stay busy, but the question still remains, what did it profit? What did we gain? Are we making a profit with our lives? The truth of it is, some people are wasting their time. They're wasting their lives. What a tragedy that God has blessed us and given us this wonderful opportunity and that we can waste it on trivia, waste it on something that in the end, is worthless and brings no value to life at all. Now, the second part of this lesson that I want to focus on is what I'm going to call the test of life. Solomon is now testing all these things, these activities, the things that we fill our days with, that, that we're so busy doing these things, he puts them to the test. And there's basically five conclusions that he comes to here in the test of life. When he stops to consider all this endless activity, these are the five things that he concludes that are important. Point A, everything is beautiful in its time. For instance, babies are beautiful people. They, they are, they, they, I, someone has said they are so precious because they just got here. They are, they're closest to heaven because they just arrived, you know. And there's some truth in that. They are so innocent. They just, they're, they're just very, very special. But have you ever met a 40-year-old baby? Was that very pretty? No, no. Uh, we, you know what I'm saying. It, it, there, there, there's, everything is beautiful in its time. There's, there's nothing that, that, that's more disheartening and is a sadder picture than to see a grandmother dressed up like a teenager. And she's trying to be young all over again. Or you, 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 you've seen men that they hit the midlife crisis, you know. They, they, they turn 40 and they unbutton their shirt and get them a gold chain around their neck and start, you know, go buy a sports car. And uh, uh, <laughs> we've all seen that happen, haven't we? And, and we stand back and wonder, what's your problem? You know, well, where do you come in? What, what's going on here? See, everything is beautiful in its time. That's, that's what we've got to focus on. At the right time, at the appropriate place, everything is beautiful. But out of place, out of character, out, you know, as someone as well said, there is no fool 
like an old fool. Boy, that is the truth. So everything is beautiful in its time. Wisdom is knowing what time it is and how to act accordingly. Boy, as I have um, matured, as some people like to say, in life and gone through life, and, and I have no regrets. If I could live it over, I would do it again. I'd do it again. I'd marry the same woman if she would have me. I, I, I would begin a, as a preacher, as a boy. I mean, I'd, I'd do it again. I have no regrets in that. But I must face the fact I'm not young anymore. I cannot do what I did when I was 21. I have to do it differently. That's one reason I'm sitting down right now rather than standing up and preaching. It's because if I'm going to be effective, if I'm going to keep on keeping on, I've got to make some adjustments. That's wisdom. That's wisdom. You must know what time it is. I love Psalm 1 where he opens up talking about the, the righteous man that he brings forth his fruit in its season. You have to know the seasons of life, the time of life. And if you do, then you can be productive to the end of your days. But if you're not, if you tried to do it like you did when you were young, it's not going to work out. So everything is beautiful in its time. Here, here's the second thing, point B. People have eternity in their hearts. Now li listen to what he's saying. This, this is in Ecclesiastes 3 and 11. God has put eternity in mankind's heart, in people's hearts. What does he mean by that? By saying that he's put eternity in our hearts, this is what separates us from the animal kingdom. Oh yes, we have life like animals, but we are more than animals. We are more than that. And Solomon points this out so clearly. He calls it eternity is in their heart. That's the reason I say, I'm not living for right now, I'm living for eternity. I'm making my decisions based on eternity. What effect will this have eternally? That's the only way I'm gonna make a profit out of life. See, both mankind and animals live in the present. We, we, we're forced to do that. But there's difference for mankind. We were made not for the present, for time. We were created for eternity. The animals are not that way. No, they do not have that in their heart. And uh, there's something that's within us that causes us to to long for a better world than this one. You don't see that in the animal kingdom. For instance, have you ever seen an animal praying? No, and you never will. You're, you're never going to see animals uh, praying and seeking after God. Seek, no, no, they, they don't do that. They don't have eternity in their hearts. But there's something that God has placed within people that is different than all the rest of the animal kingdom. It's what he calls eternity. Eternity is within our heart, and it's why we worship, it's why we pray, it's why we meditate and we seek after God. It's because God put eternity on the inside of us. There's something that, that makes us different than the rest of the animal kingdom. Now here's point C, the third thing that he discovers in this present life, now, now listen carefully what he's saying. In this present world, it is impossible to figure out everything which is being done for eternity. Remember, God put eternity in our hearts. In this life, there are some things that just don't make sense. And that's why the Bible says he's called us to live by faith. There are some things that you cannot figure out in this life. Only eternity will reveal it. I'm, I'm thinking now, a dear friend of mine was talking to me the other day about 
his mother that had been a godly woman, a godly lady, and yet she experienced dementia and she experienced Alzheimer's and uh, she really became pretty uh, antagonistic, let's put it that way. And this had been a very peaceful woman, a, a loving woman, and yet she became very aggressive. And I'm sure a lot of it was her fear because she knew that she was losing control and, and she knew something was wrong. But he, he said it troubled him deeply because his mother had been such a godly influence in his life. And he's saying, God, what can be the purpose in her life going through this, suffering this? And he said, I really struggled with that those last few years when I saw her struggling so and said, then after she died, I began having person after person that came to me, his minister friend of mine, and he said, these people were telling me about what their parents were going through and how they were, and he said, suddenly I realized why God allowed my mother to go through that so I could help so many other people that were facing something similar. See, you, you don't know that up front. You can't figure that out on the front end. It's only on the other side. And the truth of it is, there are some mysteries in life that don't make sense. There's some things that right now I would like to ask God some questions. I'm sure when I'm in his presence that all my questions will be answered. I will not have any questions to ask him. I will just, I will find fulfillment there. But right now, there are some things that don't make sense because we are so limited in our knowledge. We don't know everything. This is the reason I say there is no such thing as an honest atheist. Anybody that tells you they are an atheist, they are lying to themselves and to you. Why? Because our knowledge is so limited, knowledge is so vast. Is it possible that God exists outside the realm of your knowledge? Of course it is possible. And any honest person will admit that. And so the best that you could be would be an agnostic and say, I don't know if God exists or not. But for you to tell me there is no God, you've no right to say that because that is a statement of negative faith and you don't have the knowledge to make that kind of statement. So we're so limited. There are just so many things in this life that don't make sense and now we understand why. By grace through faith, we are saved. That's the only thing that makes sense out of many of the struggles of life. We will only understand it when we can understand the eternal purpose which is behind it. God is eternal. We are not. In this life, we are very limited. But there's eternity that God's put in our hearts, and so we should live now for eternity. Learn to live for eternity. Now, the point D, the fourth thing that he discovers is we should enjoy this day as a gift from God. A gift from God. Learn to find pleasure in the things that you have. Little things can be a great pleasure if you will just focus on that. As I mentioned, just a cold drink of water sometimes. How refreshing that is. It's simple, but more, I have learned to enjoy the simple things of life. Just a clean bed to lie down at night, you know. Just a good hot shower. I mean, just simple things, but how much they mean if you learn how to enjoy life. So the simplest of things can bring us great pleasure if we are learning how to enjoy life. The, the fifth thing, point E, is one day this life will end. Remember, we saw that in chapter 2. There's going to come an end to it, but we are all going to give an account for the way that we use this lifetime. Ultimately, every one of us, we're going to finish this life and we're going to stand before God in judgment. That is his conclusion here. And so death becomes the great equalizer that ultimately, big and small, you know, it doesn't matter. The, the rich and the poor, the, the educated and the illiterate, everyone is going to face death. 
It's the great equalizer. And so it brings us to the third part of this lesson, what I'm going to call the trial of life. The trial of life. Solomon is drawing his conclusions here. Solomon realizes in this life there are many injustices. He's going to talk about this in detail later in the book when he talks about government and those that are in positions of power. But he realizes right now that even people that we consider to be good people, good people sometimes do terrible things. We have all seen that. We've all been shocked by that. People that we thought were good and suddenly they done something that was very bad. And one of the, the uh, difficulties in injustice is people that should be protecting us sometimes become the people that are hurting us, attacking us. Well, that, that's a difficult problem to handle in life. A good illustration of that in the Bible is King David and King Saul. When David was anointed and Saul's trying to kill him because God has anointed his life. And many times that's what we experience. And so Solomon is forced to ask this question. If there is a God, why would he allow this? Or that is the question that atheists ask over and over again. There cannot be good a good God because bad things happen. And if he's good, then he cannot permit bad things to happen. And so Solomon is researching this, and his conclusion is the reason God allows this is so that we can all see what we are like without God in our lives. Without God in our lives, we're like the beast of the field that perishes. The psalmist says that in Psalm 49 and 20. Without God in our lives. And so God allows unjust things to happen for the end result. In other words, Solomon says it here, mankind without God is like a naked ape. Just an animal. Boy, we've seen people that live like that, haven't we? They live only for base instinct purposes. They live only for the base animalistic traits. That's all they live for. When you leave God out of your life, that's all that you end up with. Men that live without God end up living like animals. How do animals die? Just like men die. Now, this is where I've seen people take the book of Ecclesiastes completely out of context. And they take a statement like this that Solomon makes without drawing his final conclusion and saying, see, there's nothing to it. When you're dead, you're just dead. But you need to read on what Solomon says. He makes this statement. He said, if you leave God out, that's what happens. You're just going to come to the end of your life and one day you're going to die. And if there is no God, then death ends it all. But then he said, but, but, but wait just a minute here. Wait just a minute. He said, when man dies, there's a difference. And Solomon has some rare insights that he gives us on the subject of death here. Here's what he says. The spirit of man goes upward toward God when he dies. And the spirit of animals, of beasts, go downward into the earth. There it is, Ecclesiastes 3 and 21. That's his conclusion. He's not saying it. we're just like the animals and when it's all over, it's all over. No, 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 no. He says, that's the way it would be if there is no God. But we know there is a God. And so the spirit of man goes upward the spirit of the beast goes downward to the earth. So men don't die like animals die after all. There is a difference. See, just as mankind is the only one in what we call the animal kingdom that walks uprightly, the only one, so ultimately we will be the only one that will stand before God in judgment no none of your household pets 
your cow, your horse, they're not going to stand before God and give an account. No, not at all, but we will. One day we will stand before God and we will give an account for the way that we spent our time, the way that we lived our lives. Did we make a profit? It's well said, our life is a gift from God. What we do with our lives is our gift to God. And so that is Solomon's conclusion. One day, we will die and face God to give an account for the way that we have spent our time. And it's only those that ask God for wisdom that's going to make a profit with their lives. Those that leave God out, they're going to come up without anything that was worth living for. But those that have sought after God and have realized there is a difference, a distinction. What is it within mankind that makes this difference? The eternity that God has put in our heart. This, this being able to reconcile ourselves with our creator God. And so the question is, in what time is it? is how are we investing our time for eternity? Are we doing something with it that has eternal value? Are we making a profit with the time that God has given us? That is God's purpose for us. And there's no reason for any of us to stand before God without making a profit. God has given us that privilege and that opportunity. And it is ours to take and do something with our lives that's going to make an eternal difference. And so I pray for you that, that God will help you in your Christian pursuit, in your, your spiritual journey to learn what time it is, how to wisely invest it, and to make an eternal profit with your life. May God bless you on your Christian journey.